all please pray with me? Lord, I thank you for the simple faith that you have given to us. I thank you that you've not made it so complex. I thank you that you've made not only the gospel, but living a life of faith simple. We tend to complicate it. It's not easy, and yet it is simple. Lord, I thank you for Jim, for Judy, for Heather. I thank you for their family. I thank you, Father, for the way they have literally given their lives to do the most important thing. And while it has been very difficult, they have labored hard here, but there's some great times coming for them. Lord, I know that you will reward them greatly for their faithfulness and their sacrifice here. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to watch over them, fill them with the knowledge of your will for their lives through all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that they may bear fruit in every good work, that they be pleasing to you. And may I add us into that? Would you fill us with the knowledge of your will? Father, I know that even my brothers and sisters here this morning, there are some who are grieved. I pray that you bring them comfort. There are some who need to be stricken awake. They've been asleep too long. Lord, remind them of your grace, your wonderful, amazing grace that you give us. Lord, I pray that you would even speak through me this simple message of your word. And Lord, I trust you that you will work in my brothers' and sisters' hearts because I know you love them and I know you love us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Be who you is because if you ain't who you is, then you is who you ain't. (laughs) Now, for those of you who are visiting here, my grammar's a little bit better than that, but not much. So let me say it again. Be who you is because if you ain't who you is, then you is who you ain't, okay? Simple words, great advice, calling you to be who you are. Who am I? This is the question that a young man who had recently trusted Christ asked me some years ago. We were talking to him about the influence of Christ should have in his life, and he was transitioning from high school to college, going off on his own. And as he was going off on his own, somebody had led him to Christ. And now he was asking those questions. How should Christ impact my life? I think that's a good question, isn't it? As we were talking about this, he blurted out, okay, so how does Jesus impact my work? He said, I work at a clothing store in the mall. What do I do? Tell people I sell you this shirt in the name of Jesus? He was not kidding. He was serious. And I thought, that's a great question. And I should be asking that too. You see, many of us have sat in church for a lot of years, and we've gotten used to the fact that Jesus laid his life down for me, that he gave his life up, that Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead. And by trusting alone in Christ alone, I have eternal life. I don't know about you, but I never want to get over that, ever. I don't think the Apostle Paul ever got over the fact that you get into heaven because Jesus punches the ticket, not because I do, and not because of what I do, but because of what he did. The problem is that many of us realize what we've been given, and we think, well, I should do something about that. I need to... I need to look worthy. And then there's plenty of teachers out there that'll teach you in religion, um, religion and let me define religion for you, my definition, so it may not be yours. I'm not saying mine's better. Maybe mine's just dead wrong. But religion is man's approach to God. It's basically telling God, I will do these things for you to impress you. Like God could be impressed.
And so what happens is there's teachers like me that will say you need to do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. And you get burdened with more to do and more to do. And you walk into church ready to worship and you leave just with this heavy burden on you of guilt. So what some folks do is we naturally will say, well, I'll keep these rules here and make myself look good and I get religious pride. We all know people like that. They look kind of down their self-righteous nose at other people. But I think there's a lot of people that try and they realize they can't and they give up and they walk away because they can't carry the burden. What nobody told them was Christianity is not difficult. It's impossible to live. Did you know that? You can't live it. That's why Jesus went to the cross. That's why Jesus died in our place and took our punishment. That's why he rose back from the dead. That's why when he ascended, he sent his Holy Spirit. And when we trust alone in Christ alone as our Savior, we have the Holy Spirit that enables us to do it by grace, not by law. The more you understand this, the freer you will live. I'm not about no law. Don't, don't hear me wrong. God must be worshiped and he expects us and wants us to live a righteous life. But we get it wrong when we try to work hard and impress him. And many of you have been there and you didn't make it up. You were taught that. I've had a lot of people in my office that have said, I've been guilted all my life and I can't handle it anymore. And then they hear the grace of God and a weight falls off them. That's where God wants you. You see, they've been taught that Christianity could be spelled do, 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 keep doing, keep doing. You'll get there one day, keep doing. When others have said, and it's true, Christianity should be spelled done. It's done. Jesus did it all. So if he did it all, and I have a free ticket to heaven, how should I live? Do you think that's a good question? No? Should I shut up now? So what does Jesus want from me, and what does he want from you? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is explaining this to a group of people that have been hammered hard all their lives on legalism. Do, do, do. You'll remember I told you that the Pharisees, the religious leaders of that time, had come from a line of Pharisees that took the Ten Commandments and they formed them into 613 ordinances and laws. How could you possibly live up to that? Jesus comes into that and speaks freedom through the Sermon on the Mount to these folks. I want to read again what he had said in what we call now the Beatitudes. The subject of this message is to answer the question of what Jesus wants from you. And the big picture is he wants to influence people through you by his grace. If you would, open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to begin in verse 3, and we're going to start teaching in verse 13. We're going to go over three points here. One is, you are the salt of the earth, so shake. You are the light of the world, so shine. And last, you are a child of God, so show it. Jesus steps up, sits down on the mount, looks at the people, and as you know, 
it said his disciples came to him. Well, there was more than the 12 there. Many multitudes were there. And he started off, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You will notice that all of this is upside down from today, right? Uh, Since when do the poor in spirit look good in church, right? Since when do those who mourn get comfort? Uh, Since when do those who hunger for righteousness get satisfied? It was upside down then too. Verse seven, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you I can imagine the whole audience leaning in saying where is he going with this we have never heard teaching like this before I imagine Jesus looking right at them and saying, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The thought in their head, oh, he's coming up with a new system here. This is a whole new system. And Jesus stopped them in the middle of that thought with his next words. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. The first thing I want you to see here is that Jesus says, you are salt. Now, I think the question in their minds, and maybe the question in your mind is, why should I even live out these beatitudes? these blessings. Why would I want to do that? I'm going to be weird if I do that. Meek people don't get to the top. Humble people don't do well. They get taken advantage of. Why would I want to do that? The quick answer, the short answer is God will bless you. I think we legitimately could say God blesses the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not only will he bless you, his word, not my word, he will bless and draw others through you. And so what Jesus has done here is in the Beatitudes, he's given us characteristics. This is the character of the person who is a righteous person in my father's eyes. This is a righteous person that my father blesses. This is the kind of person where my father says, see him, see her. I love that what they're doing. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to make them exceedingly happy. I don't know about you, but I would like to be that kind of person that God looks at and said, I'm going to bless him. I like him. Did you all see that? To the heavenly host. Look at what they're doing. How about if it was, that was our church and God said, hey, have you all checked in at the chapel of Christian faith? Those folks, they really love me and they'll do whatever I ask them to do. Oh, I love them. Could you imagine God saying that about you? I hope you can because he does love you. 
He loves you deeply. And so Jesus says, since God will bless you, this will be your characteristics. What will that look like? And Jesus said, you're going to be an influencer. You're going to be an influencer in your family. You're going to be an influencer at work. You're going to be an influencer at church. You're going to be an influencer at the grocery store. You're going to be an influencer on the road, wherever you are. You're going to be an influencer. You're going to be salt. And you're going to be light. Now, if I asked you, explain to me what kind of Christian you are. Well, I'm a salty Christian. Would that be the first thing you would say? It would not be the first thing I would say. So what's the big deal with salt here? I'm sure you've heard a lot of sermons on this, so please stay with me. It won't be real long, but I want you to stay with me and to see these things as if it were for the first time that you've seen it. First, I want you to know that Jesus does not say, you should be salt. He says, you are salt. You trust in him. You're a kingdom person. You're a righteous person in Christ. He says, you are salt. So why salt? There was three important purposes of salt in history. There was more than that, but I'm going to cover three pretty quickly. The first one was, and when they heard salt, they heard, they didn't picture Morton's salt when it rains it pours. They didn't picture that, did they? What they pictured was salt was a currency. It was a form of payment. And you've heard this before. Roman soldiers would be paid salt for their work. Now we say, you know, that, that guy over there, he's not worth his salt. That's where it comes from. So a soldier who was derelict in his duties, they'd say, that guy ain't worth his salt. And so salt was a currency. It was something of value. Jesus is saying, you're righteous in my father's eyes. You have these characteristics. You are salt. You're valuable to my father. Don't we already know that? If you ever think that God doesn't know your name, or he doesn't know where you are, or he forgot to check in on you today, or maybe that he doesn't love you so much, I want you to remember the cross, because God front-loaded everything. Jesus laid his life down for us right up front. The second one, the use of salt in this time was for preservation. You all won't be surprised by this, but you realize that General Electric and Frigidaire and Whirlpool weren't producing refrigerators yet, right? That's a joke. You can laugh at that. How did you preserve meat? Because it would rot. Well, they would rub it with salt. You know that. And so salt had two purposes, currency, it was valuable, and preservation. It would actually preserve meat so it would not rot. And then there's a third reason, it added zest. Don't we know that? So if something's really kind of dull, add a little salt to that. Um, I realized recently we got a cantaloupe and it kind of went a little watery, so put a little salt on it. And... Yeah, some of you are like, yeah, yuck. It's actually not too bad. Um, how many of you have enjoyed potato chips without any salt? Well, that's just wrong, isn't it? How about french fries? No salt. Popcorn? No salt. And you're thinking, why? Why would I even bother? We understand. Zest flavor enhancer. And so that's what salt did. So they understood that salt would give, salt was valuable. It was a currency. It had preservation qualities and that it added zest. And then Jesus told them, uh, look again at your Bible. He said, verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, now how does that happen? How can salt lose its saltiness? It's what it is. And the truth is it can't. It cannot lose its saltiness. So did Jesus not know that? Well, no. I think you all realize that he invented science. 
So what is he talking about? He's talking about contamination. Salt loses its saltiness when it becomes contaminated. Uh, Let's imagine that we're at the beach and we're sitting at a picnic table by the beach and there's just sand every place, sand on the top of the table and, and you grab for the salt shaker and you knock it over and it gets knocked over, it's on the table and there's now salt and sand all over the table. So you just take it and you just kind of scoop it all back in there, mix it all up. When you sprinkle that on your tomato or whatever you're putting it on, is it gonna be real salty? No, it's gonna be real sandy, isn't it? The salt lost its saltiness. It became contaminated. And so Jesus is saying, you are salt. You are salt. If you are a righteous person, you've trusted in me, you are a righteous person, a kingdom resident, a kingdom of heaven resident. You are greatly valued. You will have preserving qualities in culture. You will add zest, add life to those around you. But if you get too involved in the world, you're gonna become contaminated with it and you'll lose your saltiness. We are loved, therefore we're valuable. We have a preserving effect, and that's the point for us, that we are valuable, we have a preserving effect today, and we have a quality of zest that we add life. But Jesus continues. He continues with, you are also the light. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. He gives two illustrations. We're not used to total darkness because we have light every place, even at night. If you try to see the stars, there's still a fair amount of light pollution where we cannot see the stars. Uh, In ancient Israel, when it was nighttime, it was dark, real dark. If it was a moonless night, probably couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. So if you happen to be the unfortunate one traveling to a city, how would you know where it was? Well, they used to put cities on top of hilltops, one for a breeze, two for protection, and that city sitting on a hilltop became the beacon to the weary traveler. Where are you heading? To that light right there, and much like a lighthouse on the sea for ships. And so Jesus illustrates, you are the light of the world. Not you should be light, you are light. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp. And there's our second illustration. Could you imagine lighting a lamp and then putting it under the bed or putting a bucket over it or something? That's ridiculous, isn't it? And Jesus is making that point. When you light a lamp in the house, it's so everybody can see. What's the big deal with light? We already know that. Light dispels darkness. Light shows us what we cannot see. Now, you all know, I confessed a few few months ago that we got a puppy now. So now we have two dogs. And so nighttime, when I go out to take the puppy out, backyard to do her business, our backyard is full of landmines. You know what I mean, right? and I'm out there in bare feet. This can be bad, right? So what I do? We put a light with a motion sensor in our backyard and the light dispels the darkness and the light shows me where the landmines are because it really would be messy. We understand what light is. And so Jesus says, you are the light. And I remind you that Jesus is the light of the world. John 8, 12. He proclaimed that. And those who belong to him have been rescued from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light, his light. Colossians chapter one. The point here is they were living in a world that was dark, spiritually dark. The people were walking in blindness. They could not see what was right and what was wrong because they were spiritually blind, as if they were in darkness. And so Jesus is saying, you are the light to show the way. And that's the point for us today. You are the light. You show the way to other people. 
And so we've looked at, you are salt, you are light. We've looked at, you are the salt of the earth, so shake a little, okay? You are the light of the world, shine a little. Let's look at the third and last point. You're a child of God, so show it. Now, I trust that you all have become a child of God. And some of you may be thinking, we're all children of God. Uh, not according to God. You are a creation of God until you trust in Jesus Christ. If you read just the first chapter of the Gospel of John, you'll find that to be true. That Jesus gave them the right to become a child of God, those who trusted in Christ. And so we are all a creation of God, but when you trust in Christ, you become a child of God. And so let's start there. Have you come to a point in your life where you've realized, I need a savior? Where you realize, I've done wrong. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What is that talking about? It's saying we've all sinned. We've all done wrong. We've all missed the mark. Well, what was the target God was aiming us at? Perfection. Well, nobody gets there. And I'd say that's right. That's why the Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. When we sin, we actually earn death. In biblical terms, death means separation from God for eternity. We know there's two destinations from earth, heaven and hell. And so, again, as I've said before, if I had a good Southernese Bible here, what I've told you so far is y'all sin, y'all going to hell. Now, if that's all I had to tell you, I would not be doing what I do today. But because of what I'm about to tell you changed my entire life and changed the direction of my life and made me want to tell people for the rest of my life, because we couldn't reach Jesus, he came to us. He came to us. God tells us in his word that for God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Trust in Christ is the only way to heaven. It's not by works, it's a gift. And that's where the ride starts. That's where Jesus punches our ticket. That's where we get to. God, I can't do this on my own. I need a savior. Save me. And he will. It's a simple prayer but it's where it starts. Have you trusted Christ? Have you gone to God and said, God, I understand I've done wrong. I understand that Jesus died for me. Right now I'm trusting in him. That's the prayer. It's not magic. It's not magic words. God knows your heart, but he will save you. And if you are a child of God, that's where we get started. And as a child of God, you are called to be salt. You are salt. First of all, you're the salt of the earth, not the salt of the church, okay? That means we're salt out there. We are salt here, but we're salt out there as well. The first thing I want, and the second thing I want you to realize, you should be adding zest. Do you add zest to others' lives? I think a lot of this is more simple than we realize. Do people feel more alive when they're around you because you're upbeat? Ephesians 4.29 tells us how we should operate our tongue. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. It's a good time to examine how we talk to people. Do our words encourage them? Do we live in such a way that we make them thirsty? You know, that they always used to say, and we still do say. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, right? Well, a wise old cowboy once said, yeah, you can lead a horse to water, and you can't make him drink, but you sure can salt his tongue. That's what we do. Through our lives, through our words, people say, you know what? You're different. I like you. You're different in a really good way. That's how we should be. That's salt. 
Are you a preservative? As salt, we should be, have a, a preservation factor of our lives. Do people notice the things you don't say? And this is a question for all of us. Complaining and gossiping, are those things kind of absent from us? When people start to do that, do we kind of back off and say, let's switch the subject? Um, swearing and cursing and those in coarse language, do we, we just don't participate with those things. There's a sweetness about us. Does anyone wonder why you're unselfish or why you're kind or caring and thoughtful? There are all things that are salt things. I think you'll agree that these things are more simple than we realize, aren't they? In a culture like ours that is quickly sliding downhill, it's not that hard to stand out today with kindness and with love. Now I remind you that we're called to shake a little salt not dump a little salt. When I was first a Christian, I would dump salt on people. I was so excited to tell them about Jesus. And they're like, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna talk about God because I can't get you off that subject. I was dumping salt on people. That was not a good thing. So, okay, so salt, we can be salt. We can add zest to other people's lives by our speech. But how can I be light? I think you'll agree, it's pretty simple. Um, one author said, many people hang out at church and they have their own flashlight parties at church. Okay, we should be light here to one another, but we need to be light out there too. So how do you be light? I think it's simple, folks. Be courteous, be kind, be thankful, be nice to others, assume the best of others, apologize when you're wrong, consider others' needs even above your own, be the reason that someone smiles today. That would be a good goal for us all, wouldn't it? To be the reason somebody smiles today. And you get to pick who that is. Let us encourage one another. Let us look for what's right, not what's wrong. Let us look to help people out. Any way we can, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, let us be the people that help others. Now, if we will do these things, then you'll find yourself that you shake, you shine, and you show others who Jesus is. And if this sounds too simple, now you're starting to understand it. This is simple. It's not easy. But it's simple. We live in a world that's increasingly rude, increasingly coarse. It's not as hard for us to stand out anymore to be that kind and considerate person. I'll close with this. You may think that's just not going to matter. Nobody's going to notice. Before I was saved, and you all know that I was saved as an adult, Patty was saved as a child. And she had a lot of Christian friends. Well, I didn't know if they were Christian or not. I just wasn't working in those categories. Didn't go to church. I had no interest in going to church. But they had an interest in me. They befriended me. The things I was interested in, some of them got interested in. When they had some kind of gathering, they would invite me, but they didn't dump salt on me and they didn't put flashlights in my face and try to blind me. They were kind, they were considerate. Well, I didn't even know I was watching them. But sometime later, years later, when I trusted Christ, I asked Patty, I said, what about so-and-so? Are they a Christian? Yep, they sure are. And how about them? Yep, they sure are. And how about this couple, yep, they sure are. I was watching them and I didn't even know it. They're salt. They were light for me. And when I had trusted Christ, I thought, yep, I've done the right thing for sure. They were proof. I want you to be proof for other folks. I want them to look at you and say, I'd like to be like you. I'm asking you all to be real, to be authentic, to be who you is. Just be who you is. You're a child of the king. He loves you deeply. And he wants to influence others' lives through you. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you even use us to woo other people into your kingdom. That when we live out 
the Beatitudes the way you tell us to do. You bless us, we're happy, and you use us to reach others as influencers for Christ. We're not out there criticizing and pointing out what people are doing wrong. We're out there helping people to see what is right. So I pray for my brothers and my sisters. I pray for myself. Help us to be that kind of example, that kind of gracious and kind example where other people say, why are you the way you are? And then we can tell them about you. So help our light to shine so that our good works show and you get the glory. I ask in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.